sitting in clinic, I had this really witty old gentleman as a patient, and he came in. And I said, uh, hello, sir. What brings you in today? Uh, he says, ambulance. <laughs> and then later on in the consult, I asked, you know what, can I take your blood pressure? He said, only if I can have it back. <laughs> Ever wondered why the skeptic suffered from high blood pressure? It's because he took everything with a grain of salt. And there's a famous uh, South African uh, Portuguese chicken franchise here in South Africa. And one of their slogans is, throw a bit of salt over your shoulder for good luck. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Ryan here. I hope you and your family are well. I strongly encourage you to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any exciting content. Today we are discussing the beautiful topic of secondary hypertension. Here's an outline. We can be tackling an introduction to the topic and some definitions, and then we're going to look at the uh, etiologies behind the disease, right? Looking at patient presentation and the way of signs and symptoms and risk factors and etiologies and some pathophysiology. Then we're going to be tackling a differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation, and investigative workup, treatment and management modalities, prognostication, complication, and last stuff we can encourage from scripture. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me. I truly appreciate your friendship on my channel. Right, so all of the following are features of Crohn syndrome, which is primary hyperaldosteronism, with one exception. What is that exception? Is it A, alkalosis, B, hyperkalemia, C, muscle cramps, D, a normal serum sodium, or is it E, severe systemic hypertension? Nice to ask, guys. So let's talk secondary hypertension. 90% of cases of hypertension are idiopathic, which is what we call essential hypertension. We don't actually know what causes it per se. But the remaining 10% are due to secondary, identifiable, and potentially treatable causes. Now, it is important to recognize which patients should be screened for secondary causes of hypertension based on clinical clues which may present. And we have to be vigilant for these or else we'll miss it. Now, secondary causes should be considered with refractory hypertension, number one. Number two, in specific clinical scenarios. And number three, in patient populations, atypical for essential hypertension. It is indeed possible for a patient to present with both essential hypertension and secondary hypertension at the same time. Now, this talk doesn't cover essential hypertension and hypertensive emergencies. I encourage you to go and uh, check out my video on essential hypertension. Hypertensive emergencies I'll be doing soon. So watch this space. Okay, let's talk about etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors, guys, for secondary hypertension. The mechanism of hypertension often is multifactorial, including, number one, activation of the RAS system, which is renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. Then, number two, adrenergic stimulation, so your sympathetics get involved. Number three, excess sodium and wanted attention. And then number four, impaired vascular relaxation. Monogenic etiologies of hypertension, the likes of Little and Gordon syndrome, and this phenomenon of glucocorticoid remediable hyperaldosteronism, GRA, uh, typically present by adolescents. Now, family history of secondary hypertension may be present. For instance, monogenic etiologies, phreochromocytoma, adopt or uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, secondary hypertension is much more common in patients younger than 33 and older than 35, uh, 55. That, those are the two groups to look at, younger than 30, so-called young hypertension, and the group that's older than 55. Secondary causes should be considered in patients with refractory hypertension, which means inadequately controlled hypertension on three different agents, including a diuretic. Primary hyperaldosteronism may account for upwards of 10% of patients who do have refractory hypertension. Now, primary hyperaldosteronism, and we said that, fibromuscular dysplasia is most common in Caucasian women aged between 15 and 50. Atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is more common among diabetics and smokers older than 55 years with evidence of a vascular disease elsewhere, so coronary and peripheral vascular disease. Hypertension is common in the context of renal parenchymal disease. We're looking at glomerular disease, especially nephritic syndrome, obstructive neuropathies, and uh, polycystic kidneys, right? So I'm sure all of us are familiar with this beautiful equation from physiology underpinning how we derive arterial pressure. It is a product of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. And cardiac output is a product of stroke volume and heart rate. And what determines peripheral resistance is vascular structure and vascular function. So problems with any one of these entities can underlie the etiology of blood pressure. So just to go through some de definitions. Uh, according to the American Heart Association, we classify, let's just get my point in there, um, 
So as you know, we've got systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Normally, it's less than 110 over 80 elevated, right? But not really hypertension get is systolic of 120 to 129 and diastolic less than 80. But what classifies hypertension stage 1 and 2? Stage 1 is systolic between 130 and 139 or diastolic between 80 and 89. Stage 2 is a systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 over uh, greater than 90 is a diastolic. All right. So here's a fun way to remember the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is pivotal to understanding the pathophysiology of blood pressure. So here we have the juxtacromedular apparatus. All right. Uh, so the kidneys will sense a decrease in blood pressure and will release renin from the JGA. Right? Renin is released, and the claim to fame of renin is that it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then in the lungs, we have this beautiful enzyme called ACE, like the ACE of spades. <laughs> angiotensin converting enzyme, which then converts angiotensin 1, those are angiotensin 2. Then angiotensin 2 then comes in and causes vasoconstriction. Right? See, this is this very muscular guy is squeezing this blood vessel. That results in an increase of blood pressure. All right? And angiotensin 2 also stimulates the adrenal glands to release aldo, right? And the claim to fame of aldosterone is that it upregulates the epithelial sodium channel in the collecting duct, bringing in more sodium, right? It also causes F and arteriolar vaso uh, constriction, right? Which is going to increase your blood pressure. And the circulating blood volume increases, further raising blood pressure. Within the kidneys, aldo promotes the absorption of sodium and water. Thank you so much. Guys, this is a very, very beautiful way to remember the causes of secondary hypertension. This is taken from Approach to Internal Medicine by Padwal et al. Thank you so much, guys. So just remember 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, cents. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, cents. So 0 speaks to essential hypertension. 1 refers to anatomical causes in the way of those involving the aorta, so coarctation, aortic dissection. Then uh, now 2, remember the renal causes. And here we're talking in the context of renal parenchymal disease. Chronic renal failure, the chicken and the egg, is CKD causing the hypertension, is a hypertension driving the CKD. Age-old, age-old uh, battle there. Then also the setting of polycystic kidney disease, renal artery stenosis on account of atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia. Adrenal causes, and there we have Cushing's, Kohn's, Phaochrome, Cytoma. And then sense speaks to SCE and TS. S is for supergrowth, speaking to acromegaly. C is for calcium, speaking to hypercalcemia and also hyperparathyroidism. E speaks to estrogen and other drugs. There's a whole host of drugs which can cause secondary hypertension, guys. Non-steroidals, corticosteroids, anabolic steroids, contraceptives, oral contraceptives, cocaine, amphetamines, monium and oxidase inhibitors, your uh, serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Erythropoietin, cyclosporin, sacro, metagen, alcohol excess, licorice root. How does licorice root cause hypertension? One, it inhibits the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2. And the claim to fame of that enzyme is that it prevents the conversion of uh, uh, cortisol to aldo. Right? So when it's absent, it allows cortisol to activate the inact channel, bringing in your sodium and causing secondary hypertension. Right? Neurologic causes like Cushing's triad, and the other word for licorice is glycerazenic acid, right? Neurological causes like Cushing's triad, you know, caused by raised intracranial pressure, right? But this is when coning is imminent. It's a very late sign to manifest. Hypertension, bradycardia, respiratory depression. Then thyroid, T for thyroid, hyper and hypothyroidism. Excessive sleep apnea. There's one that's missing here. It's autoimmune disease, especially in the context of lupus, right? So this is remember 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, stents are. Right, so zero, essential hypertension, one, anatomical, two is renal, three is adrenal, four is sense. Sense being S supergrowth, which is acromegaly, C is calcium, E is estrogen and other drugs. N is neurological, T is thyroid, S is sleep apnea, and the other A is anti-nuclear factor or autoimmune disease. Another way to cut it, guys, this taken from algorithms for differential diagnosis, okay? So here we say hypertension can be 90% of the time is primary, 10% of the time it's secondary, and then you look at your examination and your renal panel. If you've got abnormal creatinine, it's probably the kidneys behind it. Is it CKD? Is it nephritic syndrome? Is it renal artery stenosis? On account of fibromuscular dysplasia or atherosclerosis, then look at your electrolytes. If you've got hypoaldosteronism, we'll talk about that, but it's basically hypertension with hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis, all right? If the patient is obese or has demonstrated significant weight gain recently, think about pregnancy-related hypertension. Is it Cushing's? Does he have, or he or she have the clinical stigmata of Cushing's, the lemon on a stick appearance, the buffalo hump, the moon faces, the uh, abdominal stria, the thin uh, skin, right, the uh, osteonecrosis, etc., uh, the psychosis, the ulcers. 
There's a sleep apnea, or is it hypothyroidism? Other causes being renal artery stenosis, we mentioned FAO, coarctation, hypothyroidism drugs, but a nice way to certify it is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, cents R. Okay, this is the way uh, Harrison's does it. So it certifies the causes into those on the left. So in renal, we're thinking about parenchymal disease. Don't forget renal cysts like uh, polycystic kidney disease, renal tumors, including renin secretion tumors and obstructive uropathy. Renovascular causes can be atherosclerotic or arteriosclerotic or fibromastic dysplasia. Adrenal, we said Cushing's cons fail, but don't forget 17R5 hydroxylase deficiency, 11 hydroxy, beta hydroxylase deficiency, 11 hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2, which is the one we spoke about. It sits on the epithelial sodium channel, preventing cortisol becoming aldo. But in its absence, when it's deficient, then cortisol is able to activate the aldo receptors and bring in sodium, right? Fail chromocyte tumor. Don't forget aortic coarctation, sleep apnea, preeclampsia, eclampsia, or neurogenic causes. We touched on some of these miscellaneous endocrine causes and the medications we spoke about, right? Guys, this is just a rehash, and we've covered this before when we looked at Cushing syndrome, but this is the steroid pathway, right? So we have this enzyme called desmolase, which converts cholesterol to pregnenolone. And then we have the zona glomerulosa, then we have fasciculata, then reticulatus. Salt, sugar, sex, right? The deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. We said that. So pregnenolone then becomes progesterone, which becomes deoxycorticosterone, corticosterone, aldo. All this is happening. All the action happens here in the zona glomerulosa. We go to the zona fasciculata. We have 17R5 droxylase converting pregnenolone through to 17 hydropregnenolone, converting progesterone to 17 hydroprogesterone. Then 21R5 droxylase converts 17 hydroxyprogesterone down to deoxycortisol. Uh, 11 beta hydroxylase converts deoxycortisol to cortisol. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 converts cortisol to cortisone. And this is the rate limiting step that is implicated in glycerosinic acid or licorice ingestion. All right? And then we have the zona fasciculata where 17 hydroprogesterone becomes dihydroepiandrosterone uh, and 17 hydroxyprogesterone becomes androstenedione and eventually is peripherally aromatized to testo. Okay, guys, so how do patients present? with secondary hypertension. Nice to ask, eh? Well, it may be asymptomatic or may present with signs or symptoms of end organ damage, right? Where you've missed the boat and the patient already comes in example with renal failure. Or may present with stigmata of the underlying disorder. Now, renal artery stenosis, RAS, may present abruptly with new onset hypertension or with worsening of pre-existing renal disease and hypertension. And what is a tip-off is when you start ACE inhibitors, if you have bilateral renal artery stenosis, the patient goes into hormonal edema. That's what we call flash or sudden acetylmonal edema or worsening of renal function upon ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker use may suggest bilateral renal artery stenosis or renal artery stenosis of a solitary kidney. Hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis suggest Crohn's syndrome, which is primary hypoaldosteronism with mineralocorticoid excess. Labile hypertension, intermittent sweating, palpitations associated with phacromocytoma. Cushing syndrome, you know, moon faces, truncal obesity, purple stria, hirsutism. Patients with sleep apnea are typically obese, snore, and have daytime somnolence. So this is our big differential diagnosis. It could be essential hypertension, white coat hypertension, medication non-adherence. It could be renovascular, and then the two players in the game are renal artery stenosis and fibromuscular dysplasia. It could be CKD, it could be hypoaldosteronism or glucocorticoid and medieval aldosteronism, licorice, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, syndrome of a Parent mineralocorticoid X, the same one, <laughs> Cushing syndrome, Little or Gordon syndromes, which are genetic problems, phacromocytoma, thyroid disease, both hyper and hypo. Hypo causes isolated systolic hypertension, hypo causes isolated diastolic hypertension. Right, so obviously hypothyroidism gives you a wide pulse pressure, hypothyroidism, and narrow pulse pressure, but both will can contribute to high blood pressure. Obstructive sleep apnea, drugs like non steroidal steroids, oral contraceptives, cocaine, cyclosporin, and coarctation of the aorta. Guys, how do we work up patients? Okay, so one of the red flags for secondary hypertension, firstly, initial onset of hypertension. So first onset of hypertension in a young person below 30 or in the older folks above 55. Sudden onset of hypertension, especially with flash pulmonary edema, right? Refractory hypertension, malignant or accelerated hypertension, signs of end organ damage, hypertension in a patient without a family history or if you've got clinical features to suggest a secondary cause. Physical exam should include fundoscopy. You're going to pick up the Keith Wagner changes of hypertensive retinopathy. There's four grades. Retinal hemorrhages, exudates. Into a proper cardiovascular assessment with blood pressure in both arms and legs. Diminished femoral passes suggest aortic coarctation. Pick up the fourth heart sound, which indi indicates left ventricular hypertrophy. Most likely, right, diastolic dysfunction. 
And uh, abdominal examination, we can feel palpate or blot those polycystic kidneys, the sniffing abdominal breathe with renal artery stenosis. Now, how do we work up these patients, guys? Labs often include chemistries. Assess your urinary electrolytes, your glucose, your urinalysis, full blood count, thyroid function. On the ECG, you're looking for evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy or ischemia. Right, consider evaluation of plasma aldosterone to renin activity. So aldo-renin ratio of above 20, with aldosterone above 15 nanograms per deciliter, highly suggestive of hypoaldosteronism. Further evaluation of adrenal pathology is warranted. Right? Depending on the clinical suspicion, further studies may include renal surgery, renal arteriogram, and then we have traditional or magnetic resonance angiogram, MRA, or CTA, CT angiogram. Plasma, urine metanephrines, uh, or cathocolibines, and you do a 24-hour urine-free cortisol and overnight dexamethasone suppression test if you're thinking about Cushing's. You may want to do a parathyroid hormone level as well, especially with hypertension in the face of hypercalcemia, right? Now, um, I have done a video on essential hypertension, so I encourage you to go to that video to look at discussion of lifestyle and pharmacological therapy as it applies to essential hypertension. But the current JNC-8 recommended target blood pressure is less than 130 mmHg mercury for patients with diabetes or CKD and less than 140-90 in patients with hypertension without diabetes or CKD. Right. Discontinue all the offending medications if possible. For renal artery stenosis, management includes antihypertensive and or angioplasty and stenting. For fibromastic dysplasia, therapy with ACE inhibitor ARB, angioplasty may be necessary. For hypoaldosteronism, you're going to go spinal lacto and ACE inhibition or ARB. Surgery may be curative in cases of adrenal adenoma. For glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism, aldosteronism you're going to go dexamethasone. Right. For little syndrome, low sodium diet and triamterine or amylaride. For Gordon syndrome, low uh, sodium diet and thiazides for phacromocytoma, adrenalectomy, and combined alpha beta blockade. For obstructive sleep apnea, you've got to advise a patient, weight loss, a to a dietitian, consider bariatric surgery in those who are candidates. And CPAP while sleeping goes a long way, especially to reduce your pulmonary pressures. Iotic coarctation may require surgery. Renal parenchymal disease, treatment by and large depends on the type of disease. ACE inhibition and ARBs are usually recommended for blood pressure control and renal protection, especially if you've got proteinuria in the face of hypertension here. Guys, prognosis of complications, by and large, hypertension is the leading cause of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and kidney disease. Right? Patients with untreated hypoaldosteronism have a higher incidence of inorgan complications than do patients with none of the more essential primary hypertension. Genetic counseling may be warranted in patients who have autosomal dominant monogenic etiologies. Atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis infamously difficult to treat. Only one third of patients will have a significant improvement in blood pressure and control following angioplasty or stenting. The presence of fail should prompt evaluation for men's syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, and von Hippel landau syndrome. They stick together. Life-threatening malignancies may be present in both disorders. Guys, coming back to our clinical case, so all of the following are features of concern with one exception. What is that exception? Dum -dum 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 -dum. Hypokalemia, right? Constant refers to an aldosterone producing adrenal adenoma. Because aldo stimulates sodium retention and potassium excretion, all patients should have hypokalemia presentation. Not all of them have uh, high sodium because your, your kidneys regulate this by bringing in loss of fluids. You may not necessarily have the hypernatremia, but you will have the hypertension, the hypokalemia. Sometimes you may see the metabolic alkalosis. Serum sodium is usually normal because of fluid retention. Thank you. Okay, my friends. Let me just encourage you from the Word of God today. We're talking about Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27. I will give you, this is what the Lord says, I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit in you. What the Holy Spirit desires, especially in this day and age, and He's always desired it, is obedience. Obedience and truth in the innermost place. And the opposite of reason is stubbornness, right? The Bible says that stubbornness and rebellion is equivalent to the sin of divinity and witchcraft. So I pray that we will not be stubborn, but we will be reasonable people, asking for wisdom in every situation and being obedient to the leadership and direction and promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And in so doing, God will renew our hearts and renew our minds, bring us closer to Him. Amen. Guys, here are my references. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's pragmatic and it's beneficial and informative for you in your day-to-day -day practice and your day-to-day -day studies. Uh, God bless you richly. I encourage you to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any exciting upcoming content. I encourage you to like and share this video. Thank you so much. You can catch me on uh, Facebook. I have a page entitled Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. I'm also on Instagram and TikTok as well. We've got some exciting topics coming up. We're going to be talking about 
sepsis, very topical, and approaching chronic cough. Quite a common uh, clinical presentation. God bless you. Have a fantastic day.